All right, welcome everyone to this author talk today. Um, we have with us here Erica Okrent, the author of Highly Irregular, Why Tough, Through, and Doe Don't Rhyme, and Other Oddities of the English Language, which just published from OUP earlier this month. Um, I'm Meredith Keffer. I'm the uh, one of the linguistics editors here at OUP who had the pleasure of working with Erica on this really fun and insightful book. Um, all of us here at OUP love the English language. We work with the Eng English language all the time. We publish the Oxford English Dictionary, but we all know that there are tons of weird things about English, whether it's multiple words for the same meaning, uh, multiple meanings for the same word, multiple spellings for the same sound, multiple sounds for the same spelling. There are just tons of crazy things about English um, that just seem totally illogical. And what this book and this presentation will do is explain why English is the way that it is. Um, Erica is a linguist and a writer who's worked on both gesture research and brain research, but where she's sort of really found her specialty is in those kind of quirky, weird parts of the of uh, language. Her first book was um, an exploration of artificial languages, their history and their appeal uh, languages like Esperanto and Klingon, that book is called In the Land of Invented Languages. Um, and with this new book, as I mentioned, she is explaining all of the oddities of English. Um, so we will have a presentation from Erica, um, after which you will have the opportunity to ask her any questions that you might have about all of the uh, weirdnesses of English. Um, you can, if you're watching on Crowdcast, you can pop those in on the right hand side. And if you're watching on Facebook, you can ask questions there too, and we'll see them also. Um, so with that, I am going to hand over to Erica for her presentation. Hi, hi everybody. I thought I'd start by telling you a little bit of background, a little bit of inside baseball here about the, uh, the original working title of this project. Um, I think you all know how when you start a project uh, and you don't know what you want to say yet and it's a little bit uh, confusing, frustrating, you know you want to get it down, you need to get it down, but you don't know what it's going to be yet, you come up with a sort of working title that captures your emotion about it. Uh, so you might have, um, you know, if you have a geology paper to write and you might title the document, you know, dumb as a rock or something while you work on that, or if you have a a presentation to give for work, you might call it schmesentation, and then then you start working on it, and that that working title kind of captures your initial emotion about it. Uh, so the working title for this project was from the very beginning, "What the hell, English?" Uh, and that's what it was in my mind, and that's what it was for the whole time I went through it. Um, and we changed it later to something a bit milder, a bit less uh, emotional. Um, but uh, it just, that original working titles captures the feeling of the idea very well, this kind of exasperated frustration with English. Um, and it, it's now the section title of the first section of the book, um, but that spirit is very much in there and through the book. Um, however, as a title, it doesn't really present the stance of the book, or ultimately came to be the stance of the book. Um, it presents the stance of the audience for the book. If you're having this feeling, uh, the, you're the frustrated English speaker or English learner or English reader, um, when you're encountering or noticing the, all these illogical, unsystematic, surprising twists about English that English throws at you and you have that I mean, come on, man, what the hell? Uh, you have that feeling, but um, it doesn't really fit in as a title because this book is not here to indulge that feeling. It's commiserate and roll in it. It's not like, hey, what's the deal? Look at English, it's so crazy. Um, look at all these funny ways English is crazy because we have memes for that. We don't need a, a book for that. Um, uh, no, this book is, I hope, the calm, steady answer to that frustrated, flustered, what the hell feeling um, to these questions, you know, what do you do in English? Why are you like that? Because um, the common response to that is to shrug. It's like, you know, 
that's English. What are you going to do? Um, English is weird, but we don't have to accept that um, because, yeah, it is weird, uh, but it's weird in specific ways for specific reasons. Um, it's illogical. It's not so, but it's not just random, unexplainable chaos that we have to throw our hands up about. It's, it's just highly irregular. Um, so why is it like that? That's the, that's the, uh, the question of the book. Um, and I found that the best format for answering that question is to focus on who is to blame. Uh, so, and there's a lot of blame to go around. Uh, and the blame starts at the very earliest, oldest layers uh, of the language um, in the section that starts with uh, called Blame the Barbarians. These are the Germanic tribes who laid down the foundations of the language. Um, and we can still blame a lot of the weird things about English on that. Um, and then there's blame the French, the Norman invaders who came and laid down all these, all this vocabulary and other, uh, and, other and other things too, not just vocabulary. Um, then we can blame the printing press for catching the language at a bad time and setting it in print uh, and creating these habits that we still use. Um, and then we have blame the snobs for trying to consciously interfere and engineer a, in an in a inconsistent way. Uh, and they left us with a lot of things that are still strange. Um, but when we what we get when we put all of these stages together is the history of English. Um, yeah, English is the way it is because, because of its history. But you already knew that, you know, most things are the way they are because of the history. Um, but you don't just have to accept that either. You can, you can look at specific ways uh, that that history has shaped the weirdness. Uh, and I should mention, too, that this book is illustrated. Um, I worked with illustrator Sean O'Neill. We've made uh, YouTube videos, a series of YouTube videos together where he does live uh, um, uh, whiteboard drawings while I explain something about language. And so he did the illustrations and they're and they're great. And so I'm going to go through uh, and say a little bit about each one of these sections. The first blame we have is the barbarians. And the barbarians, uh, the, the one of one that I focus on here is that weird G-H in English. What, what is this spelling, this G-H? It can be in, it can sound like nothing and neighbor or eight or, or, or it can sound like a F sound and tough or laugh and um, what's happening there. And that we can blame on the barbarians because at the very earliest stage of English, we had a sound in English, this ch sound, that, um, that that was how it was spelled. It came to be spelled in adapting the Latin alphabet. How do we spell this ch sound? They don't have it in Latin. Well, various things were tried and GH came to be the way to spell that sound. But then over the centuries, we lost that sound. We don't have that sound in English anymore. Um, they do have it in, in German, other Germanic languages, and usually where you hear a ch in, say, German, like Nacht or Nachbar, you have a G-H in the English spelling, night, neighbor, nach, Nachbar, uh, and that's, um, that's a clue to this very old, old stage of the language, which is still represented in the spelling. So they, the barbarians, left us with that from the way that they said it and that we no longer say it, but there's this fossil there that we can unearth and find out why, why the GH? Ah, there's a reason. Um, or there, the, the story's more complicated than that, but that's, um, that's one of the ways, one of the things we can blame on the barbarians. Um, and we get to the French and that for that, I'm going to show you one of the drawings, which is here. I think it looks backwards on the screen, but it's a uh, press record dummy. We're making a record. Don't insult me with that insult. 
And this is about that strange thing about English in not knowing where to put the stress on words, especially if you're a foreign language learner of English. This can be very difficult. Is it insult or insult? Well, if it's a noun, it's insult. It's a verb, it's insult. How do we end up with this? Well, for this, we can put some blame on the French because um, when we, French has a, has a second syllable um, pattern, at least according to our perception. Uh, and English at its very oldest layers is a first syllable stress language. All the oldest basic elemental words of the language have first syllable stress, water, mother, father, uh, liver, iron, um, marrow, these really deep elemental parts of the language that we that were there in the beginning, first syllable stress. Um, but sometimes, uh, and, and that's when we, the, the initial nouns in particular that we got from French, um, we converted to our English way. So the earliest ones, mountain, river, um, uh, garden, uh, you know, in French they'd be montagne, rivière, jardin, um, and we, our pattern in English was to pull that stress to the first syllable. And though, but those are the earliest borrowings of, of French. Later borrowings, um, we tend to leave. So, you know, really late borrowings like baguette, you know, that's obviously a French word, but it hasn't been pulled. Uh, so, so we pull it toward the first syllable, sometimes we don't, but the old English way of doing verbs um, sometimes had second syllable stress. So while most verbs in the oldest layer were just one syllable, eat, drink, um, and usually there'd be an ending stuck on, so it would be uh, eat with the first syllable stress, eat, eat, eaten, or um, things like that. There were some words that had a prefix like beneath, uh, behave, forget, the, b, the b, the for. That was a prefix that could attach to words in the oldest layers. And in those verbs, we would have second syllable stress because you don't stress the prefix, you, you stress the root. So we were more likely, if we were borrowing in a, a verb, to leave the stress on the second syllable. That was a pattern in English that we could adapt and live with. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't very consistent. It wasn't the verb comes in, we, we leave it second syllable. A noun comes in, we draw it to first syllable. Sometimes it's one way, sometimes the other way. Sometimes both get pulled, um, sometimes both stay. Uh, we have nouns with second syllable stress. Uh, we have verbs with first syllable stress. Um, what we don't have is a split like insult, insult, where the noun has second syllable, but the verb has first syllable because that, that wouldn't match any pattern. Um, so this is something we can blame on the French, a, a kind of confusion as words came in and we were figuring out how to borrow them into English and where to put the stress. Um, and even now we don't know. So how do you say research if it's the noun or the, is it my research or my research or my address, the address? We have choices still. It's not that our isn't determined. Um, and and in, you see even in, um, even in words that are pretty, uh, pretty determined in the standard language, like police, that's from French, second syllable stretch, st stress, it stays. But in some dialects, they might say police or July or cement. We like to pull it to the first syllable, but we don't always do it. So, and we don't do it consistently one way or the other. So thanks French for that. Um, the next stage is the, uh, the printing, Blame the printing press. And for that, um, we can talk about ghost. This is a very clear instance that we can blame the printing press on. Why does ghost start with a G-H? This is not one of those H words from Old English. In Old English, it's ghost. There's no H. It's, and uh, so why do we spell it with a G-H? 
But when the printing press came over with William Caxton in the 15th century, um, he this was a new technology and very labor intensive to use. Setting type in a line is very difficult. Uh, so um, he brought with him, he had been trained on the continent. He was in, in uh, Bruges uh, where he learned the, the printing press and he worked with Flemish typesetters who knew the trade. And when he went back to England to set up a pre an English press, he brought these um, people with him and they were his typesetters. And English and Flemish are very similar languages, same language family. So you're doing English, but your language is Flemish. You have a feeling of like, yeah, yeah, I know this word. Um, but the word in, in Flemish would be spelled with G-H, like G-H-E-E-S-T, geest was geest or something, how they would say it. And these Flemish typesetters used the G-H for those words. And they used it for other words too, like goose might be G-H-O-O-S, -O -O uh, or girl would be G-H-E-R-L-E. -E. Uh, those spellings eventually fell away, but Ghost is a very common word you'd find in printing in those early days because it's Holy Ghost. It's in uh, religious writings, in, in spiritual writings, Bible writings, which are some of the first things that got printed and also spread widely. When you, once you have the printing press, you have these, we had spellings before that. There was writing, there was English writing, and there was inconsistent spelling. Some rules were developing. But most people were illiterate before the printing press. And by the time you have the printing press, it's spreading far and wide. So if you live in a remote part of the country where you have a totally different pronunciation and dialect, you might still be getting books from the printing press from elsewhere that's representing a different dialect pronunciation. And as you get literate and trained and schooled in writing, you learn that spelling even if it doesn't match your own pronunciation. It becomes a habit. The habit gets reinforced, reinforced. And this takes a lot of, this takes hundreds of years till we settle on this is standard English. There's a lot of back and forth variation, but we can blame the printing press for setting down certain spelling quirks um, and catching the language at a moment where lots of things were changing. The vowel system was in, motion at that time, something called the great vowel shift was happening at the very same time as the printing press is spreading. So a lot of stuff gets set down and then spread and then turned into a habit that now it's very hard to dislodge. There's been a lot of plans to, you know, smooth out English spelling, make it more um, phonetic, but it's very hard to unlearn habits that you learn um, in school and through reading over and over and over again, you get used to it. You try to read something written in phonetic spelling, it's very difficult because we don't sound things out after a certain point and it, it's harder to do that. So you can blame the printing press for a lot of the spelling inconsistencies uh, of, uh, of English. Um, Okay, so after the press, we have blame the snobs. Uh, and this is a later phase of the language, the 18th, 19th century, when English is now a language of the world. You know, before it was kind of a, you know, French was a language of the world and Latin and English was this like, you know, colloquial language people spoke, people used, but it wasn't like the language of, scholarship and high, uh, high pursuits. Um, but, uh, you know, over time and the uh, 17th, 18th century, English takes on prestige that way. And it as prestige comes in, people who want to use it with prestige, want to settle it as a as a, a language of rules. And sometimes they'll grab for the nearest French rule or the nearest Latin rule um, to help English be this world language rather than this language of the kitchen, language of the fields. Um, so we can blame the snobs for various things that we put into English. Um, and 
Uh, one that I talk about in the book is the word um, discreet. This is something we you'll see on any list of like mistakes to watch out for, bad things. Don't do this in English. Discreet, E-E-E-T-E, -E -E, and discreet, E-E-T, different words, different spellings. Learn the difference. Um, but really, they're the same word. And for a long time, nobody saw them as different words. Discreet, we borrowed from French. Um, and it had various spellings, but that D-I-S-C-R-E-E-T was kind of the original word. And it meant, um, it came from originally through French, Latin, discretus, which is um, to be able to, to separate, to keep separate. Um, and that turned, that became, that got the meaning of, you know, discerning, which has the same type of root, able to put things where they belong and 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 have the the right sensible practical sorting of the world that's being discreet um then in the 18th century 17th 18th century um it took on a new type of technical meaning in the ma areas of mathematics and logics you, you have discrete mathematics and that idea of separation was more important rather than the, the behavior, polite behavior type of thing. And because the people doing those things were reading a lot in Latin, because that's what most of the background was in, um, there are other words like obsolete, concrete. We, we take one of those kind of Latin words, we do the ETE spelling. So that sense of discrete got the ETE spelling. Um, and eventually it was claimed as the correct spelling for that aspect of the meaning. And E-E-T is for the other one. And now what was one word is two different words that you must know the difference between. Um, but it's sort of arbitrary because we have plenty of words like that, that we don't separate into different spellings. Um, so, you know, we have the, the word certain has, has two different main senses. I can say, um, there's a certain guy that, you know, knows how to do this. And I mean, you know, a, a specific person that I'm thinking of, or I can say, um, uh, I'm not certain, you know, being sure this is a certain, uh, this is a certain event we can predict. Those are those could be two separate meanings with two separate spellings. We could spell one of them S E R T I N and but we don't. We never did that, and we did with discrete. Uh, so a lot of these things that are oh ooh, this is a terrible error. Never make this. Are pretty arbitrary in how they came to be and were uh, you know given to us by the, by the snobs. We blame the snobs for making these distinctions and then in, enforcing these distinctions and then telling us we're dumb for not knowing the distinctions. Um, so these are, these are all aspects of the blame the snobs. Um, we can look at one that's kind of happening today. Uh, whiskey, I guess. I, I don't, I'm not going to get this right, but if it's with, if it's with an EY, it's just for Canadian, no, American, one, the EY spelling and the whiskey, uh, KY spelling are different whiskeys. So Japanese whiskey versus Canadian whiskey, American whiskey. And you got to be in the know if you're talking whiskey. Uh, you can make a fool of yourself by picking the wrong one. But you can see how that's very arbitrary. Uh, you can spell it either way. And then it's been decided that this way goes with that and the other way goes with that. And now it's a test of what you know and how uh, ingrained you are in the culture. So discrete, same type of thing. Uh, all right, so uh, that is snobs. And um, yeah, so we can blame all these historic forces for English ending up the weird way it is, um, but it's not just history alone that's to blame. Um, there's one more section at the end, and it's the one with the most chapters. 
And that section is blame ourselves. Um, Cause language ends up weird uh, simply because of the things humans do with language. Um, what we have always done and what we'll keep on doing. Uh, and a, a very quick example is the idea of figurative literally. So when you say, I literally was tearing my hair out and that's something you see as a, why do people do this? That's not what literally means, um, but it's become a big part of the language. And, and I should say the book deals with standard, unquestionably correct English. This is not, English is weird. Why do people get there and there wrong? Or why do, uh, why do people say um, uh, the car needs washed or, you know, weird, why? No, it's not about that. It's about the weird things in the high level, standard, totally unquestionably accepted language. And, but it ends on this literally uh, question, which you might argue is not that. It's not quite made crossed over into unquestionably accepted. It's still going to annoy people. It's still going to be something you get marked for. Um, but, uh, but as part of the things humans do, it's very typical for us to do this. It's one of these intensifiers that English is ever recruiting to freshen up the language. And, and it's the, the category of words that changes the fastest, change the most. How do we add, how do we heighten what we're saying here? Because when we have a word like that, it eventually gets stale. So at one point, um, very had that force. It means, comes from the French verre, the, the old French verre, which was truth truly. So it's not just strongly or the other old English words that used to be words. It's like, is this, is this cold or is it truly cold? That gives it more force. Well, not anymore though. It's very, it's just very, it doesn't have any emotional impact. Uh, and a later one would be really. So this is, oof, I'm really tearing my hair out over this. That you're saying in reality, not just, I'm not just using a metaphor. I'm really tearing my hair out here, but nobody ever objects to that. That's not a so-called mistake. I'm really tearing my hair out, whatever. Um, it's just a way of, you know, it's like very, uh, but literally, which does the same thing. It's taking, it's not, I, I'm tearing my hair out. Literally tearing my hair out is telling you, um, you know, I'm not just being metaphorical here. This is like super serious, um, uh, even though you are being metaphorical, but it's a way to add force back into an expression and heighten the impact. So one day, literally, we'll just be like, really? And it's part of the ever-changing, ever-refreshing stock of English intensifiers. Um, so, uh, so it won't, at one point, it won't seem weird in the slightest. Uh, and it won't even be one of those questions that come up is, why is English so weird? Um, instead, it will be things uh, that we don't even notice uh, or, or things about spelling. And um, that's, it's always going to change what, what strikes us as weird. And sometimes it's the history. And sometimes it's just what we do with language. So uh, I, I, that's all, um, that's all for the talk. And I'm sure there's some questions. Yeah. Thank you so much, Erica. I love hearing about, um, kind of how, oh, uh, I was just saying, thank you so much. And I love hearing about how, um, the state of English is a result, both of these like large historical forces, like the, the Norman invasion of England, as well as these sort of more individual, like the you know the snobs wanting to put latin back into the english spelling of things it's just this combination of different levels of things that have affected english over the years um so thank you so much for that overview um and i look forward to turning to the chat questions um we have a couple in so far from facebook about uh pronunciation the first one is, uh, what is the importance of learning pronunciation when you're first learning English? 
Uh, well, it depends on if you're uh, if if you're learning it if you're learning it for reading, you have a little more flexibility. Um, and if you only need it for reading, you have a lot of flexibility. Uh, but uh, yeah, it is important because if you're talking English, um, you're um, you will need to know what rhymes or it, what um, what sounds like another word in order to understand certain jokes or um, uh, other things. Uh, so it is important, but it is one of the most difficult things. Uh, English pronunciation is any other language that uses the Latin alphabet, you can write out on a page or two, here are the rules for reading out this language. Even French, which has silent words and silent letters and endings you don't even pronounce, you can write those rules out and learn them and get a text in one of those languages and credibly read it out, even if your pronunciation's not great, even if you don't really know what you're even saying while you read it out, you can't do that with English. If you write out the list of English uh, rules for spelling, there it comes to 450 pages. There's a di dictionary of English spelling that's 450 pages. It lists all the letters that can be read out to these sounds and all the sounds that can be spelled with these letters and it, both mappings are necessary. Um, so that's really difficult. But the good news is you don't have to learn all of them. Uh, you just have to get the habit and practice, hear it over and over again. And people all over the world learn English to a very high level, despite all of these inconsistencies and despite the difficulty of it, people manage to do it. Um, but not by sitting down and learning all the rules one by one. That that won't work. Um, but yeah, hearing it over and over again, getting the habit, that's how you get the English pronunciation. Great. The the next the next question came in um, a little bit earlier. So this is kind of covered in the talk, but um, this person asks, is it possible to explain the relationship between the pronunciation and the spellings from the point of view of English history? Um, yeah, for sure, uh, but not, um, but not in a very general way. Uh, so you can say, you know, for a particular word, why is it like this? And there's a story behind that, like because we borrowed it from the French and that's how they spelled it. But that won't work for a for another word that it that it maybe should work for because we also got that one from French, but that's not. That's not why the spellings word in this case. That in that case, it's because they wanted to make it more Latin, so they stuck, uh, you know, the word debt in French. D e we spelled it d e t t e, and debt is that. But later, it's like wait, but it comes from Latin debitum, and let's put the b in there so that we can see that more clearly. And so there's a different reason for that weirdness. Um, but yeah, definitely. Most the spellings uh, have a story of that of that kind, but it's going to be it's not going to be a consistent story that you can then apply in a wide uh, way. Um, next, we have a question from Macy. Love this book. Thanks for the talk, Erica. How was it collaborating on a book length illustrated project? And do you have a favorite illustration? Oh, it was great. I mean, Sean, I. I often found myself writing the piece and thinking and sort of setting up what I thought would be an image that he could latch onto or a drawing, a drawing friendly explanation, but it was never what I was thinking of. He always found some, a different way to get to it visually. And I'm not a visual person. Like I don't have that at all. So it was always, um, the thrilling and surprising to me what he found um, to uh, to address you know, what I had done, and that was it was educational for me too because it was like oh, what did he pull out as important about it was never the same thing as I thought was gonna be important or visually accessible about it, and so I learned sort of the what the um, reaction might be uh, and how it was pulled out. Uh, as far as a favorite, well, I have a 
few of the drawings on my website. It's ericogrant.com. I've put put some drawings um, underneath with the book to give an example. Um, and and a lot of them have are just great jokes. Like it, and it really adds to the um, especially when there's kind of a heavy moment. Like hey, we're getting into the grammatical explanation here. He'll find a, a fun joke for it. And I think that really helps move it along and get the flow going. So. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add for um, I'll add, first of all, uh, there are 150 illustrations in this book. So it is uh, quite heavily illustrated and they're very tightly integrated with the story that Erica is telling. So sort of as you read along, there's an illustration that ties in with the points that she's making and like Honestly, even reading the the sample materials at the proposal stage, some of them did make me laugh out loud. Mm -hmm. um, they're they're very humorous. Um, so, okay, next we have. First of all, thank you for the great talk. My former English professor told me you speak Klingon, which is seriously <laughs> awesome. So here's a question about the inconsistencies between natural and artificial languages. Do artificial languages attempt to replicate the oddities and irregularities of natural languages? or do they try to excise them? And if they do get rid of them, are they actually languages? Uh, well, yeah, for most of the history of, invented, of invented languages, they do try to get, that's one of the reason to invent a language. Oh, why is language so difficult to learn, so illogical? I will make a language that is perfect. You just learn these 10 rules and you can use it and it's easy and it's clear and it's logical. And that um, that doesn't work. That doesn't work because humans don't do language like that. That is, if it's too logical, it becomes too uh, impossible to use. Um, if it's too, uh, if the rules are too simple, you don't cover various um, uh, things you need to do with language, and then anyone who uses it is free to sort of make their own approach to it and then it be then it develops uh inconsistencies esperanto is an example of this it has very has limited very clear easy to learn rules and it's also a successful invented languages language in that people really use it um, but as they do it takes on the qualities of a natural language which is irregularities um, so that will happen when you give it to people it will become irregular uh, but Klingon, it's good that you mentioned Klingon because that wasn't designed to perfect language or have a world language. It was it was designed to give a life to this fictional universe that people could participate in. And it was designed with irregularities, dialect differences, extremely difficult grammar, difficult to learn pronunciation, all the things you would think like would make it hard and it, and people wouldn't want to learn it but people did want to learn it and do learn it and it has the flavor of a natural language um, which sort of increases the fun of it and of being able to enter this fictional universe so um, learning de developing a perfect language will probably not get you very far at all. Um, but developing a human-like language for the fun things that human wanna, humans want to do, even if it's you know, a very alien human language, um, has a better chance of getting an audience. And Kling Klingon is also one of the most, you know, like after, after Esperanto and maybe one or two others, extremely successful in and the audience it has and the people willing to like sit down and learn this really difficult grammar. Yeah, and inventing languages, inventing languages has kind of gone mainstream with Game of Thrones and other big franchises needing, you know, realistic languages that don't exist in the real world. Yeah, people write their wedding vows in it and write poetry, it's fun. Yeah. Um, so we have another question from Facebook. Why is American English creeping into English English? Uh, well, they, I think it goes both ways. I think there was an article that going around this week about English English creeping into, why are American toddlers talking like Peppa Pig? You know, they, 
um, they're picking up these these British type phrases. Um, and in that there is a there is a chapter in, in here about in the blame the snob section about how people feel a sort of um, uh, uh, protective uh, nationalism about their languages and, and will say think that oh that's an American usage so we don't do that when in fact they did do that English it, English spelling the color versus color um, that was variable in England for a long time it wasn't like it, Americans did it the OR way and the British did it the ORU Oh, you are away. But at some point, um, someone noticed, oh, the American way of doing it is O-R. So the so we do it, oh, you are. Like, and that became a self-perpetuating idea of itself. That no, we are the O-U-R language, and that's how we do it. When before it was quite variable. Uh, so often it's when people notice. Thing, the standard, the ISE versus IZE, um, that was also very variable. But once it's, it's, once someone attaches to it as, oh, that's an American thing to do it that way, um, it picks up its own steam. And then people do define themselves by, yes, this is how we do it. And that's how they do it. Um, and uh, uh, it's something that can be kind of engineered uh, and reinforced and rather than something that this was a natural difference uh, that is now infecting one way or the other. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, um, uh, uh, but Lynn, Lynn Murphy is a linguist who studies this type of uh, thing. She has a um, separated by a common language is her blog. I think that's the title of her book too, but it's a very interesting uh, to see the back and forth and what causes it and whether it's really a back and forth or not. Um. I was just saying that the, the title of her book is The Prodigal Tongue. Oh, yeah. yeah. The title, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so for Melissa, we have uh, often when we think about events or people in history, we separate them into domestic or public or political, et cetera, spheres of influence. And I was wondering if you had to categorize the bulk of the influences on the English language into one of these spheres, which one would it be? Uh, well, because this is a book that focuses on the standard, you know, the proper English, um, it's going to have more about the official channel, the official domains in the development of the language. Um, although sometimes there's a official domain um, uh, weirdness or change that has bubbled up from uh, from the from the more personal one of them is how come why do we say how come this phrase uh which which uh tracing its history originated in immigrant um ideas of how you say uh why because uh, it, it you know it's assumed that it comes from some longer proper english phrase like how does it come to be um but there is no evidence for that there's more evidence for it you know, bubbling up from a lower level of the language. Uh, but yes, most of the time this book is about the official channels and the, the, the educated domains, how we got to the point where standardized English is the way it is. Um, but it's not always because the fancy people decided it. Sometimes um, it comes from the just actual use in, in the world of the language. Um, we have a comment from Dana. Wonderful talk. Thank you. Echo echoing sentiments above and also my question, how unique are these issues to English? Are we really literally the most screwed up and difficult language? <laughs> well, that's a good question because obviously, you know, like I said before, millions of people successfully learn English and, and it's not, it's not something that's impossible at all. It's not even something that's like, particularly unlikely to happen. Uh, however, it is unusual, uh, especially in the use of the alphabet. Like I said before, other languages that use the Latin alphabet do not have the English problem with spelling. 
Uh, and that that come that is different, and that comes from a very weird moment uh, about the the history of English. Um, also, other languages like English have a, a bunch of different historical influences. Like we have the Norman invasion, or this class of people with a different language took over for a while. But other languages, you know, the the Turks in Hungary ruled, or the Moors in Spain. Like this is all there's it's not that english has a unique history in that different people different languages came to rule but the timing is important uh, uh and the and the the and that is um that is something that's different about english and why it ends up a weird in the weird in the way that it is in the particular way that it is uh, other languages are weird in other ways um but yeah, I do think uh, English has a particular Englishy weird about Englishy weirdness about it that comes from the timing of all these forces of history that happen to other languages too, but in different orders and different timing, and especially with with respect to the um, printing press and the spread of literacy, which makes a big difference. Um, from Facebook, we have the question, uh, what about borrowed words? How do we go about pronouncing them? Mm -hmm. uh, well, yeah, that's a, that's something we make varied decisions about. Also spelling, too. And um, usually we'll incorporate it into Englishy ways of doing things, kind of like how we swift sh shifted the stress to the first syllable. Um, and but but yeah, sometimes we leave it as it is, like baguette. Um, but sometimes we leave it, but then the British don't. So we have ballet and ballet. You know, um, so people will make different choices, and different choices will take over and spread. Uh, so it's not going to be a consistent like ah. The rule for importing this word is to spell it like this and um, pronounce it like this. Um, there'll be a back and forth for a while. Uh, so right now, you know, like, well, this is like SAR, SAR, SAR. we have C-Z-A-R, T-S-A-R, like which one, they're both right, we both use them um, and we can live with that confusion for a while, but usually eventually one takes over. So pajamas, was spelled all kinds of weird ways when we borrowed it um, from Turkish, I believe. Um, and we settled on the American P-A-J pajamas and the British settled on the P-Y-J A-M-A's um, and it perpetuated itself through what those communities are writing and reading and doing over and over again. So there isn't, um, yeah, the, when we borrow a word, there's gonna be a period of up in the air about it and either someone will decide um, like, that like, no, no, this is our in-house rule, that, that this newspaper, we write it this way, and maybe that will spread and become the one, um, but it's not something you can really predict. Um, what are some of your favorite new slang words? Um, well, I, I spent, spent a lot of time with this refreshing of the intensifier words uh you know how do we how do we make a how do we do the literally thing how do we make a word more exciting or intensify and i i i, I like those because they are still very it's turning over all the time uh and so you can say like oh I, you know i'm totes tearing my hair out or um uh words like that which you know, I, I'm having trouble pulling off pulling off, off the top of my head because they change so fast, and then you're already you already sound kind of rusty if you're using the the wrong one because the the pace, especially now um, with so many sub sub linguistic cultures on the internet or with meme culture and the phrases that take off like that become huge and then they become stale fast and then there's another one um i'm always noting those when those ah that one's getting stale now we got a new one uh and i like that human impulse to like nah nah how do we 
get more impact in this moment. And then you see how impact becomes staleness, the more and more people use it. <laughs> um, another question from Facebook, why is British English always a dominant figure in academic fields? Uh, well, I, uh, there, it, it's, it's tradition, I guess, any academic field is a linguistic subculture. Um, words take on uh, technical meanings in a discipline, kind of like the whiskey, whiskey thing we talked about. Like, if you're in the know, you know which whiskey to use for which country's production. And if you're in a technical field or an academic field, you're, you're in the know about something and you use phrases and words in a particular way so that you, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's a shorthand. So you don't have to like explain the concept fully over and over again. It's like, we're in this domain, in this world, we all understand what we're talking about here. So we're just going to use this shorthand, which to the outsider looks like mystical jargon. Like why is academic writing so hard to read? Um, well, it's because it's shorthand and it's useful. So you don't have to explain it over and over again when you're in your group. Um, but it can be hard when you're not in your group to like, to like realize like, okay, now I need to back up and explain this again. Um, I don't know that I have the sense that the British way is the more academic way. I guess maybe in linguistics, it doesn't feel that way. It may probably does in philosophy or, or, or some other fields. And I guess it depends on the field and who established the jargon, who established the technical specialist use of these phrases or words. That's what's gonna determine what gets used in any particular domain because it's the useful shorthand that where we all, we all know what we're talking about here so we can save some time. All right, we're getting close to the end here. We have about five minutes left. Um, I actually wanted to ask you a question of my own, which is, um, do you have a, a sort of favorite question about English that you were not able to include in the book for whatever reason? Uh, well, yeah, there were a few that I, that I kind of gave up on because they were too hard to, not too hard to explain, but took too long and too many facets to it and it sort of defeated the purpose uh, that I was trying to have like there is an answer and here's what it is like you don't want to say there is an answer and here's a 10 page explanation <laughs> uh, and one of those was why is there a silent e um, I think that's a very common type of thing that kids will wonder about when they're learning to spell learning to read um, but yeah I didn't do that particular one um, because it became too uh, too heavy, especially for a kid who'd be asking that question and wants a simpler answer. But I, I mean, you know, not that there's no way to express that simply. It's just one that I kind of left aside to do other things, uh, and um, uh, you know, maybe I just got. I, I, I threw up my hands at that one, but it's not because it's impossible to explain at all. It's just one that I left aside that I thought, oh, I should probably do this and then just didn't get around to it. Um, all right. Well, that about wraps things up. Um, again, the book is highly irregular, why tough through and doe don't rhyme and other oddities of the English language by Erica Okrant with illustrations by Sean O'Neill. Um, and it answers a lot more questions about English than we were able to cover today, but I hope you enjoyed uh, joining us here and um, I hope you all enjoy reading the book as well. Uh, so thank you again for coming and thanks to Erica. Thank you. Thanks for having me.